Welcome to the fall 2020 Elie Wiesel lectures on Finding Moses. With the theme of these lectures, we are turning to one of Professor Wiesel's passions, the great figures of biblical and Jewish tradition. We will learn about Moses in Jewish Midrash, in the Quran and early Muslim tradition and in African-American literature. The first of this year's lecturers, Dr. Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg, is the author of Moses, A Human Life, Yale University Press, 2016. I hope you can see it right here. Her lecture today, The Sense of an Ending, Finding Moses in Midrashic Literature, will focus on the last stage in the life of Moses when he knows that he, his end is near and that he will be denied entry to the promised land. As in all her work, Dr. Zornberg will take us, I'm sure, on a journey of psychological depth and literary subtlety. Why Moses? In my view, there's no more important figure in the Jewish canon of great person personages. Moses looms especially large right now as we observe the failings of political institutions to meet the challenges of our time. Moses is valued in many traditions as an inspired and inspiring leader, but he too had his limits and failings. And much of what we think or know about Moses is not in the text. And if it is, finding it requires ingenious feats of interpretation. I cannot imagine anyone better equipped to take us on this journey of discovery than Aviva Zornberg. Dr. Zornberg grew up in Glasgow, where her father held the position of chief rabbi and head of the, the rabbinical court. She holds a BA and PhD in English literature from Cambridge University, which my colleague uh, Steve Katz likes to joke is the only real university in England. For the past 35 years, she has taught Torah in Jerusalem at Matan, Yakar, Pardes, and the Jerusalem College for Adults. Dr. Zornberg also holds a visiting lectureship at the London School of Jewish Studies. She travels widely, lecturing in Jewish academic and psychoanalytic settings. She's the author of The Beginning of Desire, Reflections on Genesis, 1995, which won the National Jewish Book Award, The Particulars of Rapture, Reflections on Exodus, uh, published by Doubleday in 2001, and Bewilderments, Reflections on the Book of Numbers, 2015 can show you this one as well. So now, without further ado, I invite uh, Dr. Zornberg to give the first of our three Elie Wiesel lectures on Finding Moses. Welcome, Dr. Zornberg. Thank you very much, Professor Zenk, for those generous words. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor. honor. To, it's a great honor to be speaking in this series in memory of great Elie Wiesel, uh, who is so much, uh, is, is so important in the history of the memory of the Holocaust, the traumatic memory of the Holocaust. Um, in connection with Elie Wiesel was simply to the depth and really of his great book, Night. affected my whole life of deep connection with issues of the Holocaust. And now I turn to the sense of an ending. The sense of an ending, which I chose as my title, refers in very general sense to the ending of Moses' life. That's where what I'm, that, that, what's, what, what, what I'm using the expression for, the sense of an ending. Now that word sense is important. I take the phrase from um, an important book by the eminent British. There is a disturbing noise. Is someone, does someone need to unmute? Is that the, the problem? Yeah, please everyone keep yourselves muted. Thank you. Um, the, uh, Professor Frank Kermode uh, British literary critic, one of his, perhaps his most famous books was called The Sense of an Ending, and that's where I draw my title. By the sense of an ending, he meant, thank you, 
He's very specific about it. He meant to refer and to study the ways in which human beings imagine the ending of the story, of their story, of the social story, of the world's story. In other words, how people and cultures imagine the end of the story and remember in some form the beginning of the story. And this is a framework, this provides the framework within which to imagine one's own place in the story. Once one has a, a memory, quote unquote, as you'll see, of the beginning, and one has some kind of anticipation of the ending, which is imaginative because no one knows for sure what the ending will be in anything. Um, once you have that framework, then the, the moment in time that you are living can be given a certain kind of significance. And now you can see where you belong in the plot. Now, what uh, Frank Kermode does is work through this theme in terms of both the apocalyptic theme in history, how societies and religions have imagined the end of the world, and how that helped in some way to evaluate one's own point in time. But also, he's interested in fictions. He's interested in novels, in stories, in plots, and the ways in which artists create plots in which in some, through which, in some way, we can begin to find out things about our own worlds and about how we are placed between the beginning and the end of our own lives. That is, we may know something about the beginning, but we don't know the end. What we may have and perhaps must have is a sense of the ending. That is, of what one expects, what, what one anticipates, what one hopes for, what one desires. These are all matters of inner, the inner life. And that theme that he's setting up um, rests then on the idea of fictions, not only as applied to novels, but as applied to philo philosophical ideas about how things will end. Um, he uses a very simple and helpful example. He calls it a tiny model of all plots. And this is how I want to start my discussion of Moses. The tiny model is, he says, the ticking of a clock. And this is, if, if, if you've read the book, then this is surely the one part you, you don't forget. That, that's certainly true of me. The ticking of a clock. What everyone knows what a clock says. A clock says tick tock, tick tock. Now that, of course, is a fiction. A clock does not say tick tock, right? We are lending the clock, you know, our language somewhere. Right? We, are, we are projecting onto the clock a sense of form, a sense of plot between a tick and a tock. And they are differentiated in our fiction because the beginning and the end is not the same. And that gives us a sense then of, um, of a framework within which the interim time can become significant, it can become organized, and we can have a sense somewhere of the, the, the form, right? the significant form within which we live. Now that uh, ticking of, of the clock, uh, he then explores the idea through an experiment in experimental psychology. It's a very simple fiction. Uh, the experiment was done um, asking the subjects of the experiment to listen to the ticking of a clock and afterwards to imitate, to duplicate the time span between the tick and the talk, and then the time span between the talk and the tick. Yes? Um, of course, objectively speaking, the two time spans are identical because there is no tick and there is no talk. But what was found was, of course, as you might imagine, that people found it much easier to duplicate the time between the tick and the talk than between the talk and the tick. Because the tick, I'm not I'm tired of saying this, but the time between the tick and the talk is significant time. It's time, um, Kermode on the other end of the spectrum uses learned, learned Greek uh, terms to, um, to, to make this distinction. He says the time between the tick and the talk, the significant organized time, the plot as it were, 
that has a spotlight sh shone on it, we call that, yeah, he wants to call that kairos. Whereas mere successive time, time that hasn't been shaped and formed, I like the space between the talk and the tick. Who knows how long that is? That, that hasn't been contained within our imagination. And that he calls chronos, mere successive time. But what you have between the tick and the talk suddenly is electrified. Suddenly it's something that has significance and we can then imagine through that form, through that imposed form, the fictionalized form, we can then begin to imagine something about our own lives. Now, the way we anticipate the ending, of course, may turn out to be completely wrong. That is, one can live one's life anticipating an ending, and here we come to Moses. One could live one's life anticipating an ending, Moses expecting that he will be leading the people into the land of Israel, because that was God's promise from the beginning. Right? It was, it was uh, clearly the sense that he was redeeming the people, he was taking them out of Egypt, uh, of course at the behest of God, and and in the end he would bring them into that good and spacious land, Eres Tova Uruchalba. So the plot was set out for him, it seems, very clearly. At least, I would say, the conscious plot. But then there comes a moment, and it's a mysterious moment, a story about hitting a rock and not speaking to a rock. What happens in Memeriva, a place is called Meriva, and it's narrated in the Book of Numbers. I don't want to take any time on this, but just that is the first shocking moment in which Moses is told, Moses and Aaron are told unequivocally because of some sin that they have committed and the sin remains eternally um, unknown somewhere. No, it, it's very hard to arrive at a cogent notion of what was the sin that brought down such a decree. Because of this sin, because of X, they would not lead the people into the land. That is, for the, at the very, towards the end of Moses' life, he realizes that the ending is not going to be what he expected. There's a shocking um, subversion of the plot. The plot was expected to be A, and suddenly it becomes something entirely different. And then, at some unspecified moment, and this is where we come into the text for today, at some moment, Moses speaks to the people in the course of the book of Deuteronomy, of which perhaps around a large part, around a third of the book, third to a half of the book, is composed of Moses' own words, his own speeches to the people. Ela hadvarim asher diber Moshe. The book begins, these are the words that Moses spoke at the very last stage of the journey. Ba'arvot Moab and the plains of Moab, and he then reminds the people in chapter three of how I, and the I is important throughout Moses' last speeches, how I beseeched God at that time to let me enter the land, and he refused me. Now that's my one sentence um, summary of what I want to look at a little more closely in just a minute. A most poignant account to the people of how Moses had his plot changed on him, how he had expected, and perhaps even till the mo moment of this prayer, he still expected and hoped that God would nevertheless open the gates for him, rescind that decree, otherwise why did he trouble himself to pray? He must have had some expectation that it's in the way of God's decrees that sometimes he releases the, the, the bond of the decree, la tir, la tir neder, to let it go. And he expects on some level that's what's going to happen. The original plot will be reinstalled, reinstated, and it doesn't happen. Um, before I read the scene more, a little more closely, I wanted to read you what Kafka says about the ending of Moses' life. Kafka starts from the point of view that Moses, in experiencing his life suddenly in a disjointed way, everything is out of joint. 
up to now it had had a purpose, it had had a rhythm, it was part of significant time. And now suddenly, here he is left high and dry without the ending that he had expected. But there is a tragic cutoff here. And Kafka takes this as the norm rather than the exception. In some way, Kafka simply disposes, it's his first move really, he disposes of the idea of the tidy ending, of the ending that one can expect and hope for. And he makes a general rule of it, right? He, he turns the, the, the notion of a sense of an ending on its head and says that what actually is the nature of human life is incompleteness. I'll read the passage. He is on the track of Canaan all his life. It is incredible that he should see the land only when on the verge of death. The dying vision of it can only be intended to illustrate how incomplete a moment is human life. Incomplete because a life like this could last forever and still be nothing but a moment. And then the last sentence, which is so powerful, Moses fails to enter Canaan, not because his life is too short, but because it is a human life, right? This is not the kind of tragedy that says, if only he had lived a little longer, then he would have achieved his desire. That's, that's one kind of tragedy. And that's a common tragic plot, actually, that somehow it's almost by happenstance that he doesn't achieve his ending. No, says Kafka. It's a human life, and that means that that's the way it goes. And he becomes now a model. Where does Kafka get this lugubrious idea you know, of the anti-plot plot, that that's the way it goes? Well, one source, I don't know how familiar he was with these sources, but hypothetically, one source could have been from, from Jewish tradition from many Talmudic statements um, that say things like, no man dies with half his desire in his hand. Yeah. No one dies, that is, having achieved his desire. Achieving your desire has something to do with endings. It has something to do with how you imagine how things are going to end. That, that imagining is extremely human. It's cons cons constitutionally human constitutively, I would say, human, that expectation, that desire, but equally human is the foiling of the desire, the not managing it, because it's a human life. And with this, let's move in, let's zoom in, as it were, um, to the text in chapter three of the book of Deuteronomy. I'll just read it very briefly. I'll, I'll look at the, the main words. The, I, the, this is not on your source page. You haven't arrived at the source page yet. Um, I beseeched God at that time. Chapter 3, verse 23 in Deuteronomy. I beseeched. It's an exceptionally intense word for prayer. I, I threw myself on the mercy of God at that moment saying, Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your powerful hand. That is, the story has just begun for me. And now, please, Ebrana, let me cross over, please, and let me see that good land which is on the other side of the Jordan. And the expression that Moses uses here is Ebra, la avor to cross over, to pass over. The land which is on the ever, the other bank, the other side, the other edge of the Jordan. What is it to pass over, to cross over? It's a fairly common word in biblical Hebrew. Fairly common uh, word in biblical Hebrew. It means to move from here to there, right? very simply. It's not the only way of talking about entering the land. It's actually a new way of talking about it. It's, it belongs in the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Numbers, by and large, till just before the end of the book of Numbers, what's the word that's used to go into the land? The word is la'alot, to go up to the land. 
right? The spies didn't want to go up, you know, didn't want the people to go up to the land. That is, it is, it's that spiritual movement upwards into the land of holiness, and that's the word of the book of Numbers. But when we get to the book of Deuteronomy, and here is Moses using the word with great passion, I want to cross over. And one wonders, because sometimes, as we'll notice as we go on now, sometimes the word is used with, the ref with reference to the river that has to be crossed, the River Jordan, which makes it a purely geographical word, reference. And sometimes it's used just by itself. I want to cross over. Not, not cross over the river. I want to cross over and, and see the land, let's say. So the movement of crossing over, it seems to me, has, acquires a kind of fraught resonance. That is, we don't just take it as fording the river. That's the, that's the objective correlative. That's the basic objective reference. But, And so Moses refers here to the other side of the Jordan, to that good mountain there. And then we read with a play on words that can't be missed. Vayit aber Hashem bi lemanchem, and God was furiously angry. And there is the word evra, evra, which is um, it has to do with anger, which also is based on the root laavor, to cross over. Now, what has crossing over got to do with anger? I mean, the only thing I can say at the moment is that it's God, I would translate it perhaps, God was transported with anger, right? a sense of a, of a, a trans movement, right? a, trans, a movement beyond himself. It was a, an intense anger of some kind, which comes as a shock, because we understand now that Moses is describing God's reaction, even for, before he narrates what God's answer was. That is, Moses has an emotional sense of God's reaction that God was extremely angry with me for your sake, because of you. Very strange. Talking to the people. It's in a way your fault. In some way you share responsibility for this, this anger. And he wouldn't listen to me. Now all this is Moses narrating not even yet God's response. We don't hear that God saying no. All we have is Moses' emotional sense of God's response and the fact that actually God refused to listen to him. Wouldn't even hear him out. Lo shama elai means really, he interrupted me. Yeah, he interrupted me. He stopped me in the middle of my words and he said to me, Ravlach, that's quite enough. In other words, very harshly, I would have to say, it's painful reading every time I read it. It's not, uh, not easy. Here is the God who always listened to Moses. Even when Moses was asking for outrageous things, like pardoning the people who have just been condemned to death. Moses always had access to God. Who did Moses have problems with all along? Who wouldn't listen to him throughout the story? And who did Moses sense never would listen to him from the beginning of the story? That's the Israelites. That's his own people. That is, Moses' life up to this point has been based from its very beginning. We're thinking of the plot of Moses' life. What sets the scene is the very beginning when God calls on Moses at the burning bush and commissions him to go to Pharaoh and to save the, 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 Isra the Israelites from Egypt. And immediately, the first response in chapter 4 of Exodus, Moses replied to God at that time, they're not going to believe me and they're not going to listen to my voice. That is, from the beginning, Moses sensed they're not going to listen to me, and indeed they don't listen to him afterwards. But, that, but the fact that historically they don't, and the fact that Moses comes back to God afterwards and says, look, lo sham u elai, Israel, you see, they didn't listen to me. So how do you expect Pharaoh to listen to me? You keep telling me to go talk, to go speak to people, but speaking doesn't work with me. I'm not a speaker. I can't speak to human beings. How does he describe his speech problem? from the beginning, from the burning bush. You remember, it's almost grotesque physical description in the, in the Bible, in the Torah, 
of what it feels like to be in Moses' mouth. I'm putting it a little, a little grotesquely. He says, I am of heavy mouth, kvad pe u kvad lashon. I am of heavy mouth and heavy tongue. I have these impediments in my mouth, right? It's not, we, we talk about a speech impediment slightly metaphorically, but impediment means heavy baggage. It means my mouth is weighed down, my tongue is weighed down. That's what it feels like to be me when I try to speak. Then he says, Lo ish I'm, not, I'm not a man of words. Right? That could be a much more general problem. But finally, perhaps the most grotesque uh, self-description, this is how Moses feels about himself as a speaking subject. He says, Ani aral svataim. I have uncircumcised lips. Well, that's a really grotesque one. In some sense, there's a foreskin, like a webbing closing his lips. Whenever that's his imagine, imagined sense of his speaking ability. What he's really saying every time he complains to God in those early parts of the story, what he's really saying is, I can't make them listen to me. When he says they don't listen to me, he's only partly blaming them, but he's really blaming himself and he's blaming God for sending him. Right? In some sense, there's a feeling of not being cut out for this role, which goes very deep. With, with, with Moses. And on this, there has been an enormous amount written in classical commentaries, in mystical, in Kabbalah, in the Zohar. Uh, is it entirely a bad thing what Moses has? Perhaps it, it, it's a certain kind of elite situation. However it is, it's a very unhappy situation for Moses in relation to the people. By contrast, God has always listened to him. There's no question about that. And now look what is happening. The last time, right, when Moses talks to God and asks him for something, God interrupts him and says, stop right there. Don't go on talking to me anymore about this thing. Al tosif daber elai od badavar hazeh. Which means, really, I don't want to hear from you anymore on this matter. And here is God refusing to listen. As Moses himself said, lo shama elai. He slighted me by not listening to me. And that is the very painful story now that Moses narrates to the people. If he hadn't narrated it to the people, we would never have known about it. And so the strongest, the strongest question I have to ask about this story, why does Moses immediately or not so immediately, we don't know exactly the timing, run and tell the people the story as part of his significant winding up speeches, that you might almost call them deathbed speeches, that he makes to the people. He's not on his deathbed, but he's in the last five months of his life. Sorry, five weeks of his life. The dates are given. I mean, the date of the beginning of Devarium, or the book, is given. And tradition suggests that Moses died on the 7th of Adar. That gives us Shvat Adar, the beginning of, of Shvat, to Adar, five weeks. In these last weeks of his life, why does he include this painful and humiliating story of God's rejection of him, of God's silencing of him, when all along, all God had been telling him to do was talk? From the beginning, go talk, talk, talk. Right? And now suddenly, the one the one uh, place of grace, the one place where God, where Moses could feel a certain comfort and a certain ease in speaking, which was in his relationship with God, right? suddenly God pulls that away from him. About this matter, on this matter, I don't want to hear from you again. So it's not quite as total as I may have made it sound now, but on this matter, and it's very harsh. When did Moses make such a prayer? We have no indication in the text of the Torah that that was the moment that Moses prayed to God. If he hadn't told the people about it, we wouldn't know about it, right? There'd be no record of it at all. What would we have lost? Why is it so important that Moses has to actually tell 
people this very painful story, especially as it doesn't end well. It doesn't have a good ending. Right? I understand if he would tell the people a story that was painful, but then was resolved in some clear way. But there is no resolution here. He indeed does not get to go into the land. Now, if you, um, I, the, the sources will come in just just a moment. I wanted to um, I, I wanted to suggest, actually, on the basis of midrashic traditions, so one suggestion that's that's given is that the moment when he prayed to God should be assigned. It should be slotted in. Right? We we don't have any. Any, any documentary evidence, but it should be slotted in somewhere toward, towards the end of the book of Numbers when the people have been already con conquering much of Transjordan and they are preparing to divide the land up into different, por por different parts for each tribe. When the seven, the five daughters of Tzlovchad come and appeal to Moses, to God, for a share in their father's inheritance, even though normally sons alone inherit land. And their transgressive appeal, which they make with great wisdom and great discretion, um, is granted. And God, in fact, compliments them on speaking well. Dovr Ken benot tzlovchad dovrat. The daughters of Slavchad have spoken beautifully, exactly right, harmoniously, meaningfully. Ken, right? it's the very simple word ken in modern Hebrew. Yes, it's as if God is saying speech. Yes, right. Finally, someone is speaking well. Immediately after that, there is a reference. We read that God says to Moses. Now go up to the top of this mountain of transits, of crossings over. El Har Avarim Hazeh is chapter 27, verse 12, I think. Um, go up there and look north, south, east, and west, for you shall not cross over there. Um, and I'm going to appoint Joshua in your stead. And on this, Rashi says, that God suddenly telling Moses to go up the mountain of transition and look his last, surely this is a bit early for that, look his last on the land because he's not going to lead the people. The, 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 uh, the, um, the guess now is, the speculation is, that it must have been in response to Moses' prayer, which is not actually documented. Why would God suddenly tell him, you know, go up and look your last? It's, that was at the moment when Moses had tried to pray. And that story gets dropped from the text, but that must have been the moment. That's one of, an, of a couple of suggestions. Why do I bring it up? Because it's exactly in that context, in chapter 27, that we read after that, Vayidaber Moshe el Hashem. And Moses then spoke to God and asked him to appoint a good, effective leader in his place. The strange thing about that is the word Vayidaber. Moses spoke to God. How often um, do you imagine Moses, does Moses speak in the word Lidaber, in, in using the word Lidaber throughout the whole Torah? He is Vayomer, of course, all the time. He says to God. But Lidaber is an expression of force. Lidaber is to use the language of leadership. It's used to, to use somewhere the language of power. So God is constantly being medaber, but Moses, this is the only time, this is the first time of the only time in which he speaks to God. There's a great force. He makes a demand of God, who tovea. And suddenly Moses, at the moment he's been told for sure, if that is the moment, that his prayer is not answered, that he will, he's lost his, his final hope that he will enter the land. Instead of plunging into a depression, in some sense, that, I can use the word sublimation, that somewhere there's a kind of process of sublimation, which means that he takes his own disappointment and his own disillusion, and it somehow stokes the, the fire of his own capacity to speak to God effectively. 
And even so, he's always been successful, and now he talks with some force. And there is a wonderful midrash that puts it, that generalizes this, and says that when Sadiqim, when righteous people leave this world, and they turn from their own affairs, their concern with their own affairs, to the affairs of the community, right? The Sarchet Sibur. At that moment, Ke'ilu Ba Bizroa. It's as if they come to God with a strong arm. So suddenly, Moses acquires it's a kind of an inrush, you know, of energy, of force in talking to God as if there is the feeling that somewhere all his desire, which has now been blocked at one exit, has now been turned to something else. And that is the desire for the welfare and the future of the community. Now, we can put that in simple ethical terms, and I think we can make some sense of that. I'd like to try to make some more psychological sense of it, uh, not to say psychoanalytic sense of it. And in order to do, to do this, I want to, to suggest um, that if we look uh, throughout, the, throughout the Torah, we will have the word la'avor, to cross over, used in many different contexts in which there is this basic form. And the basic form is atem ovrim ani eneni over. Moses speaking to the people in the first person, and saying to them, not once, but many times, putting the contrast in front of them, I and you, you are crossing over, I'm not crossing over. I'm not going to cite all these places. You can easily look it up if you're, if you're interested. Sometimes Moses just says, you are crossing over. And one wonders why he's con constantly saying that. After all, it's very clear that they're about to cross over it, 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 for, for many reasons. Um, but he keeps on harping on this theme of you are crossing over. Why does he need to keep telling them the obvious? Why does, what, what is involved in that way of, of, of addressing them? What is he actually saying to them? What is the rhetorical purpose of his reminding the people they are about to cross over? And most powerfully, of telling the people this painful story of the refusal of his own desire to cross over. Just as a sidebar, let me just remind you perhaps that when the two and a half tribes come and they say to Moses, um, please let us stay on this side of the Jordan because the, the pasture land here is great and we have a lot of cattle. Please let us not cross over to the other side. And they actually put it like that. And Moses gets very angry with them. He says, Al ta'avirenu et hayarden. Please don't make us cross over to the other side. Now it turns out that um, concretely speaking, in terms of the plot of the story, Moses, quote unquote, misunderstood them. He thought they meant they don't want to cross over and identify with the peoples and take part in the wars that are going to be necessary to conquer the land. In other words, it's a failure in solidarity on their part. They want to stay here in comfortably with the, with, the, with the good pasture lands and let the people cross over and conquer their own land over there. And they make clear, no, 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 we don't mean that. Of course, we'll cross with you to, to help the, the national effort. But we want to come back and make our place on this side of the Jordan and not on that side of the Jordan. I just want to point out how it must have sounded to Moses, whose greatest plea was, please let me cross over, to have two and a half tribes saying rather complacently, rather callously, please don't make us cross over. The last thing in the world we want to do is cross over. And suddenly we have a sense again, or I have a sense that I'd like to convince you of, that this doesn't refer just to crossing the river. It's a habit of mind. It's a way of being in the world that I think introduces the, uh, the sense of the erotic. That's the argument I want to make. That Moses is someone who knows what it is to constantly desire to go from this edge over to the other edge, go over beyond what is my territory to start with.
And that is a kind of constitutive part of his world of desire. That's his history. That's the history of his life. It comes to... I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you hear me well? Yes. We hear you well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so he's very upset with them because clearly they don't, they don't share his, the, the span of his desire. There's something, there's a real disjunction between himself and, and these two and a half particular tribes. If you now look at the sources, um, I'd like to trace, if you look at number four on your, on your source page, um, I believe you've all been sent sources, is that right? Yes, I posted the link again to the Google Doc in the uh, com in the chat. So if you if you just press that link, you will be able to access the Google Doc, which has the sources in Hebrew and in English. Wonderful. Yes, I'm going to translate from the Hebrew rather loosely, but the part the parts that I find interesting. Number four, this is the Mea Shiloh, great Hasidic commentary on the Torah, great Hasidic master very provocative, very unexpected in his, in his teachings. And he says this, he takes us back to the beginning of the book of Devarim, the book of the words that Moses spoke, because that's how the whole book gets entitled. And he takes us back to the ninth verse of the first chapter there, when Moses says to the people, I said to you at that time, again, we don't know what time, but his speech to the people begins like this. At that time, sometime, I said to you, Lo ucha levadi, sit etchem. I can't carry you alone. And therefore, please appoint people who have the qualifications of wisdom, understanding, and distinction, who are well known as, 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 uh, as uh, sagacious members of society. He uses three expressions, chachamim, nevonim, veyiduim. Appoint important people to act as a kind of support system for me, a bureaucracy, if you will, because I can't lead you alone anymore. You're a bit too much for me. Somewhere you're just, you've always been an enormous burden and, and now you're getting, you're getting worse in some way, or at least at the time that, that he, he said this to the people. Appoint people to help me out because I can't do this job alone. That's the obvious meaning of Moses' speech. But our Hasidic master here says this. When Moses was coming close, when they were coming close to enter the land, Moses felt that it was the will of God that they will enter the land at, under the leadership of Joshua and not under his leadership. Now that that Moses felt this is a little strange because Moses was actually told it, but it sounds here almost like an intuition. But Moses wanted, he desired, that the people should pray to God and, and, and say to God that they have no, they don't desire any other leader. In other words, what is Moses' real desire? And the, it's so real and it's so fraught that there's no way he can say it explicitly. You know, the real stuff. What does he really want of them? He wants them to pray for him from a position, from a place of, we don't want any substitute leader. We want Moses. In other words, it's a game of desire here. I can trans use the word desire now. Moses desires, and it's an unspeakable desire, no leader can, or maybe, <laughs> I'm not so sure that no leader can say this now. Um, leaders apparently do say these things. Um, can say to his people, I want you to desire me and no one but me. Right? There are various indirect ways in which you can court <laughs> that kind of devotion. But you can't be direct about it. Right? If you can't, a lover can't tell his beloved, I want you to want me. I want you to want me is a kind of classic turnoff, right? I, if you want to be wanted, then you have to make yourself wanted, right? You, it's up to you to seduce. It's up to you to, to create desire. But to speak about your desire as something I desire of you, right? that doesn't work. 
And so what he's trying to do now is to hint to them, according to this extraordinary reading, by saying, I can't carry you alone. I can't lead you on my own. By which he means, on this level, he means, I can't continue being your leader unless you help me. Unless, not by appointing other leaders, but by praying for me. In other words, that you invest your desire in my continuing as your leader and in the ending of the story being one in which I have an active role and I'm still alive and, and, and they're uh, leading you. That's really what he's asking them. And he's hoping, if you look at the passage there, it's very clear. He thinks, he hopes that they will understand what he means. They'll understand it. But they don't understand it. And there is suddenly this strange obtuseness that's called they did not understand. Now, can you expect people to understand a hint? Maybe the hint was just too delicate. It's too delicate, and so they didn't get it. And so in the text, they answer, Tov hadavar, that's just great. In other words, whatever you want, we'll, we'll, appoint, uh, we'll appoint leaders. They don't get the hidden meaning. They don't get what he is really implying, the implicit meanings of what he's saying. There's a failure of a message, of the real message to come across. And this leaves, it's a very open-ended sort of situation there. What we find in the text is, at that point, that they do appoint leaders who are wise and distinguished. The one group that is missing is people who are understanding, Navonim. And in the Midrash already we read, they don't appoint understanding people because Navonim lo matzati. I couldn't find any intuitive people. I couldn't, that, right, Bina is that particular kind of cognitive knowledge. It's what we call emotional intelligence now, I think, putting it very roughly. No emotionally intelligent people. Now that's quite a, that's quite a thing to say about, about the Am Yisrael, the people of God, on the verge of entering the land, that Moses finds them somewhere emotionally obtuse. And therefore, that group, that, that adjective is, no, is, is not used of the people who are concretely appointed as aides to Moses. They got the obvious meaning. They didn't get the implicit meaning. When I read this Hasidic text uh, relatively late in my, in my life of study in the last few years, um, I wondered about, did he, is this a modern reading? I would almost call it a postmodern reading because it leaves everything so much in the air in a sense. It puts the whole drama in the realm of getting the hint. Okay. Rather than obeying a command, it's picking up on something. It seems a very loose way of, of, of writing in a book of law, you know, about a book about, about its situations that have to do with law. It's not a legal situation. Um, is there any midrashic? I wondered, is there any midrashic precursor for this? And I looked and I found, I think there is, that's a state, that's also a, something that the sages say, right? If you, if you look, you will find, right? If someone says, I looked and I didn't find, then don't, don't believe it, they, did, they didn't really look. In this case, I found, and I found two midrashic passages. And while you're looking at your source pages, I want to move on with that. Rather quickly, you can read, you can fill in for yourselves, number five and six. When they came to cross the Jordan, Moses reminded them of how often he had asked Bikesh Sanegoria. He had acted as their defense counsel. How many times he had defended the people when they were in trouble. Most notably, of course, in the story of the golden calf, when they really were facing ca catastrophe as a result and Moses interceded for them. And somewhere Moses at this point reminds the people of that. Why does he, it's one of the stories that he tells them, why does he have to tell that story? Because when he defended the people in that way, says our Midrash, he thought, Savur, he was of the opinion that they would do the same for him if ever he needed them. Now, 
I, I'd like to, to set up a nuance here. I don't think this means, I, I would I'd be very un, unwilling to read this as Moses thought in a tit for tat sort of way. You know, that I did it for them, I think they should do it for me. Uh, that, that, no. <laughs> I want to say it means this, that he did it for them and he was so sure of the relationship that he had with them, that it was reciprocal, that they were on some level really together, that they, they knew what he had done for them, that they would of course reciprocate. That is, it's something about the quality of the relationship in Moses' mind. And now he has to tell the people over and over again, ata over, atem ovrim, right? Many different ways. You are crossing over, I'm not crossing over. Why didn't you pray for me? Or perhaps even pleading. Every time he says you are crossing over, he's actually implicitly saying, please help me to cross over. Now that's a similar kind of logic to the one that the Hasidic text gave us. That is that the conscious overt meaning of what words mean, yes, of what words say, is only part of what words are doing, right? There isn't a thing as performative language. That what you, you, what you say things and you hope to achieve something through what you say. You're not just describing a situation. If Moses says, you are crossing over and I'm not crossing over, he is trying to create a world in which they will intervene for him. He's creating a frame, a plot, a, a wished for plot. And they don't get it. And then the analogy is given as a mashal, a parable very poignant parable, from a feminist point of view, almost unreadable, uh, about a king who married a woman and they had a lot of children. The king had a lot of children. With all The details are always fascinating. The king had a lot of children through this, um, through this aristocratic lady that he had married. And then somehow she displeased him and he decided to take another wife, to divorce her and take another wife. So she, he calls her to him and he says to her, have you heard that I'm about to take another wife? And she says, uh, aren't you going to tell me the name of the lady? And the king gives the name. What does the lady do then? The, the, the wife, what does this, this aristocratic lady do? She gathers her many children together and she says to them, you know, your father is going to take a wife, another wife. Uh, implicitly, it means he's going to divorce me. Um, uh, can you put up with having a stepmother? It's kind of loose translation, if you're following the translation there. Uh, in other words, he's implying stepmothers, you know, have a, have a, have a bad, a bad uh, press. Stepmothers, it's not going to be the same. And they answer with great peace of mind, you know, great uh, tranquility. They say, yes, that's fine. And he, he tries to say something, uh, she tries to say something to them, you know, about stepmothers, you know, you won't have me as the, the, the bulwark, is that it? Something to stand between your angry father and you, you know, and fathers and sons in the Midrash always ha have this relationship of, of confrontation and anger. There is something of that, you know, as well as love. I was a wonderful go-between for you. I was, I was both your mother and his wife, so, a stepmother is not going to do it. And they are quite at peace with it, it's as if they don't begin to get to get it at all. Now that kind of obtuseness leads Moses to say in the Midrash, now I'm no longer worried about you, about, about getting you to, to, to do the right thing for me. I'm worried about you now. If you are so insensitive, if you have so little idea of the implications of things, if you are so little capable of understanding what's not fully and blatantly said, if you have no bina, how are you going to get on with your father? Somewhere it needs a certain kind of play. It needs a certain kind of subtlety to know how to get on with a father. You have to have to understand things about relationships. If you have no capacity of that kind, I'm worried for you now rather, I think, you know, you should be worried about you rather than worrying about me. And in some way, that means that Moses, right, in the analogy, is now concerned for the people that they don't pick up 
on what he is implicitly and poignantly asking them. Have a look at the next Midrash then. V'lo natan lachem Hashem lev ladat begins. It begins with a quotation from the end of the book of Dvarim, right? Just before the end. One of the last speeches, right? We've moved from the first to the last. Um, last speech, God has not given you a heart to know, eyes to see and ears to hear until this day. That's quite a statement. Almost his last statement to the people. You have all along been, and the way it's usually understood is Moses criticizing the people. Right? There's a lot of there's a lot of rebuking of the people in the book of Deuteronomy. The word that's used, the rabbinic word that's used is tochacha, rebuke. Um, and rebuking the people either overtly or covertly. What is rebuke? That's one question I want to deal with in, in just a minute. For instance, saying to them, you have been amazingly insensate all along, as if you don't have eyes and ears and a knowing heart. Lev Lazar, isn't that, that's what the heart ideally does, right? The instrument that knows is not the brain, it's the heart in, in biblical metaphor. It's the heart which both feels and knows, right? That the two, the, two, the two functions are one, ideally. But you don't seem to have, you seem to be very badly equipped. You haven't developed your sense, for instance, uh, as Rashi says, of gratitude and appreciation to God for all the wonders that he did for you. Somehow you're amazingly, I'm looking for a word here, um, right? unfeeling, just you have very low, responses, very low, low tension responses. And that, and Moses is very disturbed by it. Could it be that Moses is here talking about his own history with them, that he's also talking on a personal level? And that's the, the suggestion that Aaron Midrash now, now, now makes. He's not only talking about the national history with God, their religious uh, falling on their faces all the time, not really getting the, 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 full, the full wonder of their history with God throughout, throughout the story, constantly rebelling and protesting and so on. Maybe it also has to do mic microcosmically with their relationship with Moses. And Moses is here saying to them, he's talking bishvil atzmo. He's talking about himself. Now, isn't that a bit of a come down that Moses moves from the grand, right, from the high ground of talking for the people to something so personal as you failed me when I needed you. Right? That's very personal territory. It's not very dignified to, to confront your people with your personal grudges, as it were. One could think that this is really reducing the scale. It's reducing the scale of the story, if we are to take it on a personal level. But that's exactly what this Midrash then proceeds to do and puts it like this. I'm going to put it very briefly. Please do read the, read the text yourselves in um, either in Hebrew or in English. Um, Moses made two passionate requests of God. One God granted and one God didn't grant. One was to forgive the people. Slachna la'am hazeh. Please forgive this people after the golden calf. And God granted it, and he said, Salachti kidvarecha. I have forgiven as you have spoken. Right? In other words, I'm responding to the power over me of your words. In other words, you speak well to me. You speak to me in such a way that I hear you and I respond. But then Moses pleaded, Ebrana, please let me cross over that erotic reach that he wanted himself, something for himself, his desire. And God answered them, Lota Avor, you shall not cross over. Joshua will cross over, you will not cross over. And Moses protests and says, I don't understand. Why can't I have both? Right? It's, it's a very, an area, it's a very natural human response. I would like that you should say yes to both my requests. Why does it only have to be one, one or the other? And God says to Moses something a little indirect, like, Moses, you're trying to grasp the rope at both ends. Strange image here. 
you are you are trying to grow. You can't have both. It's either you or the people. I must say, I have some sympathy with Moses. Why can't he have both? Now, why does it have to be either or? It seems almost as if it's in the nature of the gain. I put it very crudely, you gain some, you lose some in the world of desire. That desire has to do with, and here I want to move into the heart of my, of my, um, my reading. Desire has to do with eros. And eros can be a desire for oneself, or it can be a desire for others. In the end, if Moses has to choose, then he chooses the people any day. If you look at the, at the end of that midrash, he says, let a hundred Moseses die. A hundred people like me die rather than one nail on, their, on the finger of their hands be, be harmed. All right, it's a kind of really exaggerated it's an exaggerated choice that he makes. And he makes such an exaggerated, such a clear choice between himself and the people. And when it came to, to his need, to the time when he did something of the people, uh, he began to rebuke them. He began to give them tochacha. To rebuke them, and he said to them, I shall meet them, there's a similar idiom that I've heard used about parents and children, one man could save 600,000, and 600,000 couldn't save one, right? The people failed him, all 600,000 of them, where he managed to redeem all, all of them. And there's a sort of irony and a bitterness about that, and the sense that he's rebuking them. And with this, I want to move into the erotic breach of Moshe and of this, this cry of his, let me cross over. I think of Eros here now in terms of a wonderful book, um, a really brilliant book uh, by Anne Carson, C-A-R-S-O-N, called Eros the Bittersweet. Eros the Bittersweet. This is a quotation from the Greek poet Sappho. Yes, S-A-P-P-H-O. Uh, one of the great lyric, Greek lyric, lyric, lyric poets. Um, in which he uses that expression, eros, the bittersweet, desi bittersweet desire. Uh, in Greek, it's sweet, bitter. Uh, the sweetness comes first, and then... And Anne Carson writes this extraordinary book about the nature of desire, of human desire. Kafka's, it's very close to Kafka in a sense, in its unexpectedness. Kafka, the idea of desire as having sweetness and bitterness at the same time. It's not just, it begins sweetly and it ends bitterly. Yeah, not necessarily, but, but that there is sweetness and bitterness inherent in human desire. Because it is an attempt to cross over. It is an attempt to reach out beyond one's own edges to something different and other and impossible really to unite with. One can never become thoroughly mixed up with that other thing, excuse the <laughs> down-to-earth expression. One can only yearn for a union with the other and perhaps achieve a certain measure of delight as one imagines or momentarily glimpses a sense of union with the other and then loses it in the very same moment. Now, in Greek literature, which is Anne Carson's field, she has many examples of this, of the delight and pain, of the sense of being able to reach out beyond oneself and achieve astonishing moments of going beyond oneself and delighting in the other, and then the inevitable limitation that somewhere something fails actually the very um, concrete image she uses from Greek lyric poetry is the desire for ice on a hot day, the desire to hold ice on a hot day. And you know, as you hold the ice, the part of the pleasure pain of holding the ice is that the almost painful cold of the ice will melt, it will become quite congenial, but it will lose then that quality that made you desire it. The coldness is something you wanted and yet is very hard to stay one with. Right? It's a very, a very limited image. 
Aristotle extended this question of eros to the way, the sense in which, as he says, all human beings by their very nature reach out to know. There's always an attempt, a desire to go beyond one's own proper status. One stands at the edge of oneself, as Anne Carson puts it, and one reaches out beyond oneself. It's not on the basis of one's value as a person, but on the basis of a certain desire to know. That is, in courting another, in courting one's love, and in paying attention and reaching out towards knowledge that I don't yet have, there is something of the same mixture of bittersweetness. You will have more knowledge than you had if you reach out, and yet at the same time, there is something impossible about that, that what you really want will never satisfy you. Once you've got this, you'll immediately want to go on because the desire is for desire. And that's actually a Kabbalistic uh, statement, a statement for, from the Zohar, right? The, the capacity to desire desire, to, to, to take in, to take in the, the delight and the pain which are one of the world of, the world of desire. And there the word lo'avor, to cross over, I think it's, it's a way of talking about reaching out in this sense. Uh, what do we have? For instance, I looked up the Oxford English Dictionary on th the word past. When something has passed, right? In the past tense, let's say, in terms of time. And the Oxford English Dictionary reads past, gone, lapsed, done with, over. That's an un unintended pun, over and over. That is, in some sense, to, to la avor is to reach out, to want to move from here to there, but in some way to disappear as you're doing it. Right? If you la avor, then you, it, you, are no lo you are not anywhere in the end. In some sense, from someone's point of view, you have passed by. Human life is compa compared to tsel over, a shadow that passes, a passing shadow, right? Not enough that it's a shadow, it's insubstantial, but it's also, you only get a glimpse of it as it's moving past. Song of Songs, right? It's, it's the most, most powerful, monumental example of, of this experience that's so ephemeral. It's not a monumental at all. The love relationship is one in which dodi chamak avar, my beloved slipped past me, that slippery sense. For one instant, the beloved was there, and then he'd gone past me. Because I sought him, and I couldn't find him. Because the finding would be the end of the seeking. And on some level, the seeking is what I want. Right? On some level, that's what, that, that's what I desire. And so that even the happiest loves, on some level, they have this, this paradox bound up in them. And of course, when Moses makes his other great request of God, which God refuses, right? it's not the only time, right? The two great requests that he made for himself, the other one was at the top of the mountain. When he had been begging for the people, he also asked, please show me your glory. In other words, I want to see your face. That's how God translates it. And says, no human being can see me and live. But this is what I will do. I will take you and I will place you in a crevice in the rock and I'll cover your eyes with my hand. Yeah, kapi alecha. I'll protect, cover your eyes with my palm, with my hand. And as I pass by, right, as, I, as, I'm, as I pass by that crack in the rock, you may have a glimpse of me. Probably not, because I will remove my hand only after I've passed by. And you will see my back and not my face. That mysterious, you'll see because no human being can see my face and live. Now, perhaps in, ter in terms of time rather than space, it makes more sense that what we have here is a description of that what you are left with is the sense that the beloved has been here, that God has been here. 
and there's a trace left, right? That's the, the postmodern expression. There's a trace left. It's an intangible, invisible trace, but that's what you're left with, right? You're left with the, the kesher shel tefillin, as the rabbis put it, the, the, the knot of the tefillin that's at the back of the head. You don't get to see the front of the tefillin. You get to see, you only get to see the knot, the knot, which means that with which you can relate, but which isn't directly the presence itself. Now, that sense of translating, right? All the trans, all the, all the words that begin with trans, yes? Uh, translating, transfiguring one's desire. That somewhere there has to be a kind of movement into another mode before one can have any um, full satisfaction in one's desire. That eros has to do with shifting from one level to another. This is Anne Carson, again, very beautifully. She says, metaphor, which means actually carrying across, right? carrying beyond, carrying across, means that I take two things that are absolutely different from each other and I say, they are active, they're incongruous with each other. And I say, ah, oh, put them together. And one gets a flash suddenly of seeing how they could belong together. All right, very simple example. It's not even a metaphor. Uh, my love is like a red, red rose. Yes, for some reason, I always fall back on that. Uh, my love is a red, red rose, let's say. Well, a woman and a rose, what are you talking about? Couldn't be more different. But through force of imagination, through force of desire, I bring the two together for a moment and I see it. I know that it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's transformative, that the la my language can create an image of my beloved by using the word rose. And then immediately my ambition, my desire is wrenched apart again. And each, each of those terms falls apart again into its own proper place. A woman is not a rose, a rose is not a woman, and we return then. So there is the limitation, there's the pain, and there's that, that flash of desire that achieves something. Something difficult to, to, to define. So I'm suggesting, and we are now uh, at the last stretch, I'm suggesting that when Moses' real desire is painfully, right? That's the pain of desire. It's painfully, God says to him with an unequivocal clarity. It's painfully blocked from him. Moses is immediately then, in a way, moved to reach out to another horizon. There is another horizon now in just because of the people's obtuseness, just because the people haven't helped him, they have blocked his desire as well. He can't get through to God. God has said to him, don't talk to me anymore about this matter. And I want to put emphasis on the word, yeah, bear a lie. There is another theater for your desire. There is another horizon for you. Go back to the people with whom you've never felt comfortable whom you have never been able to speak to, to talk to convincingly, so as to achieve what you might have wanted to, to achieve. Go back and do what needs to be done to transform your desire into the future after you are gone. And in the reading that I'm suggesting here, in all those times when Moses hints to the people or reminds the people of his hinting, and the fact that they hadn't had the emotional intelligence to respond to his hint. All through that, we have a kind of repressed history throughout the book of Deuteronomy. It begins with leading you alone. It goes on to you're crossing over. I'm not crossing over. These are always in, always in a sense of, of seducing the people. How shall I, can I put it? To recognize Moses' presence here as a person who can mochiach them, who can rebuke them with the idea, the English word rebuke is a very unattractive word. The, uh, the, the Hebrew tochacha has in it the word nochiach, to nochachut, to be present. Moses speaks to the people in such a way as to make himself for the first time, and that's what's so strange, just at the end of his life, he makes himself fully present to the people. 
and he's fully present in his way now of urging and exhorting the people in other parts of the book to keep the laws and to remember the national experiences, even though he's talking to a new generation. He says, it was your pet, you know, it's as, it's as if it was you who stood there at Sinai. It wasn't really them, it was their parents. So he's trying to teach them to use that emotional intelligence, that imagination, that intuition, to carry on from something that is not concrete for them. And in order to make them somewhere, to make them move, to make them develop some kind of knowing heart, he stands in front of them with a new address, with a new way of presenting himself to the people. And this way of presenting himself is, um, I suggest, what leads to the rabbinic expression about Moses that has become so synonym for Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moses has become our teacher. It's not a biblical expression. When, did Moses, when was Moses the teacher? Rather than saying that all along he was their teacher because he was teaching them law, he was teaching them authoritatively as the mouthpiece of God, he was teaching them God's laws, I want to suggest that the moment when he becomes their teacher is this moment when he begins to tell him tell them his story. When he begins to stand in front of them with his full humanity. And this is a humanity that has to do with unconscious struggles within himself. That as he is speaking to them, they are silently listening. Like that basic situation. They are silently listening while he talks endlessly. It's not a, right? Who does that? Well, Teachers do that on occasion. Um, this teacher is doing that uh, uh, at, at this moment. It's not exactly the most, um, the most modish way of teaching these days. Um, but I'm suggesting that what we have here is a kind of paradox. Now. That Moses, and this is, um, I'm taking off on a, a provocative idea by the French um, essayist, philosopher, uh, Roland Barthes, B-A-R-T-H-E-S, um, who says, who makes this analogy, he says the teacher in front of a class is in the position of the analyzand in the presence of the analyst, the psychoanalyst. Right? It's a kind of reversal. In a way, the position of the teacher, which seems so powerful, right? he is speaking uninterrupted. No one, everyone is muted while, while he talks. Wonderful, terrible as well. Because now there is a sense of being cast vulnerably on the floods of language. Now you are giving yourself away, like the patient in psychoanalysis, who talks and talks and talks. And as Shoshana Feldman uh, says very beautifully in in a, an important essay on psychoanalysis and education, comparing the two. Both are impossible in pro, uh, professions. That's what Freud said. Education is an impossible, for Plato said it actually, originally. It's impossible to teach. And Shoshana, basing herself on Freud, elaborates on it and says this. He says that basically it's an impossible profession because when one, one stands in front of the class, what one is doing and what is the class getting? What are they getting from you? They're getting content, hopefully, yes. But more importantly, they are finding out, they are learning the teacher's unknown knowledge. The teacher's unconscious knowledge, the things that the teacher doesn't really want to tell you about himself, herself. Nevertheless, they are coming out with silent audience like the analyst Right. The, the, uh, the analyst is supposed to know everything. The analyst actually, she says, knows very little. He only knows what he's read in books and his experience of other patients. He doesn't know you. He doesn't know the patient. And the patient is now busy giving himself away by not paying attention to the important things, by not talking about public 
things, but talking very intimately and almost inconsequentially. Things that don't seem to belong and don't seem to be important. And that's how the analyst is getting to know the important things that there are to know, which on a certain level, the patient knows, but is not, doesn't know that he knows. This is psychoanalysis, unconscious knowledge. Moses is speaking now by telling this painful story that doesn't have, it doesn't have a good ending, right? There's no resolution of the story. God said, you will not go across, and indeed he doesn't go across. What does Moses do with it? He reproaches the people for not helping him. Now that's a little embarrassing, isn't it? I think we, we implied that before. You know, why is he being so personal? But that's, that is the place from which he now speaks to them, not as an authoritative God, God messenger, but for the first time as a human being, as a human being who has been given this role. And it's all, in a sense, for their sake. And it's for their sake, as God says to him uh, in, the, in the Midrash, every time uh, Moses is having a good time with God at the top of the mountain, right? Har Sinai, the giving of the Torah, God, twice God says to him, Lech Red, get on down there. He sends him down back to the people. And the Midrash comments, it's very, again, very sharp, very harsh. Atal Lamali, what do I need you for? It's, it's, it's again, almost unbearable. Everything we are doing here is Bishvil Yisrael. It's all for the sake of Israel. Your life and your, your spiritual connection with me and what you will do with it afterwards, how you will be the human being who had this connection with God and what that will do for the people, it's all for their sake. It's all Bishvil Yisrael. So get down there. You know, it's not a matter of going up at this point. It's a matter of going down, going into the human world. And it seems to me that in these last, these last weeks, these last uh, weeks of his life, Moses develops a different kind of subjectivity in relation to the people. That he is speaking to them just in this, in this mode that has to do with modeling what it is to be interminably learning. Freud talked about analysis being an interminable process. In other words, Moses is saying to the people, I am not the one who knows. I am the one who is constantly learning. And learning doesn't only mean intellectually learning. It means being in a way emotionally out of it, not knowing what to do with what my life has presented me with. Here I've been refused by God in what I most want. And here I am in turmoil and I'm blaming you. And in other words, he is staging for them the full turmoil and the full reality, the chachut of a human, human being who has had extraordinary access to God, but nevertheless remains with the one desire of trying to reach out to the people, trying to find a way of connecting with the people. And so he speaks and speaks and speaks. And the question is then, as we'll finish uh, with this, uh, the question is, does he achieve what he wants in this transferred mode, in this transferential mode? Does he manage to come across to the people as he wanted? What he says to the people at the end, again, is bittersweet. It has two ways of hearing it. God hasn't given you a knowing heart, etc., until this day, until this very day. The bad news might be, to this very day, you are still amazingly um, insens insensate, that you haven't, you're, you're not reacting. Or it could mean up to this day, but today I sense that you are now open, that you are, have now grown, you have now allowed yourself to be taught by your ignorance, right? that I've confronted you in some way with this strange gap between myself and myself, right? What I think I know and the other things that I'm not so sure that I know. And now at this point, perhaps you have a more perceptive heart and seeing eyes and, and hearing ears that something has been achieved this very day. Hayom hazeh 
Moses says to the people, this, peop this day you have become. That is, a process has built towards some kind of conclusion for me. But before I leave, I can see that you have somewhere allowed yourselves to be affected by my desire to reach you. Somewhere things have moved so that perhaps from now on, you will have that capacity which up to now you're so painfully lacked. And that's what will allow you to survive, actually, because you will have a capacity for asking questions. You will have a capacity for not taking things as just clear. Yeah, that's what it says. But for what we call now the oral law, yeah? Torah Shabal Peh, the possibility of asking questions based on the question, really, what does it really mean? What did Moses really mean when he said that? No, that's not a historical question. It's simply a question of limitless curiosity. It's a question that says, how do I make sense of this? How do I find in myself an ability to do something with my desire that will, in the end, be the key to your survival? That, that, that intellectual and emotional capacity is something that I'm suggesting Moshe is directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, he's trying to reach out towards in these last, these last speeches. These are not repetitions of past, of past knowledge. These are an attempt to break through to a new curiosity on the part of the people, a faculty of imagination. And uh, we have some grounds for thinking, at least, that Moses, in this, Moses could die without literally crossing over to the other side, to the very end, Shama Lota Avor, God's last words to him are, there you shall not cross over. There, but in other, in other trajectories of desire, you have found a way of being all there, of moving, of moving across that your presence has allowed itself, to, has, has, has managed to make an impact uh, on the people that will have everlasting resonance in terms of their uh, curiosity and their constant desire for continuing and changing and moving meaning. Um, I'm going to stop there. Do we have time for questions? Well, first I want to say thank you for this well-timed uh, and wonderful introduction to what to most of us is invisible because most people don't read the Hebrew texts. So people who do have the facility of looking at the Hebrew texts can make these discoveries. And it's incredibly precious, in my view, for us to have started this series with your lecture. You, you, you brought to our attention what it means to find Moses in the text. For that, you have to read the text and you have to read the Hebrew text. And you have to read it attentively and with that kind of literary um, imagination that you brought to this text. So I want to thank you uh, very, very much for this um, wonderful introduction to this series. Um, and yes, um, our students are still online and our guests are also still online. So if we want, we can have... Um, conversation. Please. Will you, um, Professor Zank, will you choose a question or two? I will. I will start with Mackenzie. Hi, my name is Mackenzie. Thank you so much for this very thought-provoking lecture. Um, I had a question about um, maybe the earlier life of Moses, um, kind of talking about the aspect of desire and um, the fact that Moses was more so living through the people. Is there anything in the early book of Exodus in Moses' early life that could suggest that Moses lived for the people and God chose Moses specifically for the people and never for his own desire? No. <laughs> no, my point, my point, I probably wasn't clear enough. I think that desire emerges fully in Moses uh, only once his own desire has been blocked. And he's always, of course, when God says to him, go down the mountain, he goes down the mountain and he talks to the people. But he already knows that he's not going to manage to, to come across with a full 
fine. He knows by experience and he knows he's blocked by his own expectations in a sense that he, uh, he knows that he can't speak. He kn that's the, the, the thing he knows most, most eloquently about himself, that he can't speak. Um, that is a kind of block to the kind of dedication that we're talking about. And it seems to me that he transcends, that's again the avoir, trans, he transcends that limitation at the moment when he fully acknowledges it and tries to move beyond it. I think that, that's what I would say. And that's, that's the drama of the book, of this last book, it seems to me. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question from Miriam. Miriam Diamond, who asked, do you see any connection between Moshe's desire, la avant, and the concept of avera, sin, transgression? Yes, of course. I mean, they come from the same root um, because there is something transgressive about desire, of course. It means going beyond the legal edges of myself and pretending that I actually flow into the other person, right? It's a, it's a pretense, it's an illusion, right? And yet it's a legitimate illusion. It's an illusion that's part of what makes us, what makes us move, what makes us know more. Um, but I think the transgressive idea, you know, sometimes it's wrong to do it and sometimes it's, it's an expression of that restlessness, which is desired to know, which is desired to go beyond ignorance. And there's a question from John Lister, Nick. Um, isn't God's kiss at the end of Moses' life the resolution of the erotic? Uh, the kiss is not in the Torah, right? Is the kiss in the Torah? I find myself suddenly not sure. We will That's check. Right. Pardon? Will you check? We will check. Yes, I'm sure some people here could tell us. Can anyone tell us? Or you're all silenced. What's the question? Is, it, is the kiss of, of God to, Mo, to Moses, is that in the text? It says, Al Pi Hashem, that Moshe died, Al Pi Hashem. Okay, thank you. That's a relief. <laughs> okay, I felt very exposed at that moment. Um, that is, it's not in the text. <laughs> Al Pi Hashem means by the word of God, loosely translated, but idiom idiomatically translated. The literal meaning by the mouth of God leads to the Midrashic tradition that it was actually a kiss. That there was a kiss there. And that is on the level of, of, of implication. That's on the level of imagination and what really was going on there. In, on that Midrashic level, yes. In that, on that Midrashic level, he does achieve some kind of apotheosis there, but it's not exactly what he wanted. <laughs> Nevertheless, he wanted the land. That, that, for some reason, was how he framed his desire. Maybe he achieved what he achieved because of his work with the people. Perhaps it's because he came down the mountain so very well that he was able to go up the mountain and meet God in this, you know, in this, I don't know what the word is, in this climax, in, in this sense of, of a climax uh, and satisfaction of desire. There are other students who would, would like to ask a question. I'm not a student, but I'd like to ask a question. <laughs> Go ahead, and then we'll uh, give Mackenzie another chance. Okay. Um, just as a quick aside, I was in Ellie Wiesel's original 1976 class at Boston University, and this is quite a tribute to his scholarship and his memory. So, to Dabraba. Um, my question, Dr. Zornberg, is we have also studied that in when this was perhaps written in retrospect, perhaps in the second century, that this was really, we did not want to deify Moses. We did not want to have our current or future generations worship him. He was not to be from God. He was a human being with foibles, with, with warts and all. And so the part of this story of him not being able to enter the promised land was to assure that we saw him as a human being and nothing beyond that. So I'd like to see your, uh, hear your reaction and your comments uh, on that premise. Thank you. I think that's, 
I think, I think uh, that notion, of course, we do have it in the Haggadah, that Moses is not mentioned in the Haggadah. That, that idea, that in a way, we want to take Moses down a peg or two. Right? Okay, but in the text as we have it, uh, in the text as we have it, we have Moses who seems to be um, not just taken down, but taking himself down by exposing that story. Why expose the story? If it was just a matter of God refused him, that could have been narrated uh, as a fact, simply. It could have been part of a third person narration that Moses prayed to God and God refused him. That would have done the job of reducing Mo Moses. Instead, we have this strange framework of a narrated story that Moses chooses to tell the people. And that's where this issue of delight and pain, you know, this issue of eros, the, the, the reach and the limitation as one thing, as one, as one moment, that's where I think it comes to expression uh, in Moses' own way of presenting himself. That's where Moses becomes a subject, in other words. I just had, you don't so you don't believe that there is a rabbinic tradition that happened maybe after this that this is not exactly the word of Moses Moshe Rabbeinu that this was done intentionally so that he was not deified that he was not made to be um, by, more than a human being and I'll stop by, there. by the fact of having his desire uh, foiled he he that's what shows him to be a human being. That that humiliating, uh, that, that's a deliberate humiliation in a way. That he that had he entered the promised land, had he had it not been Joshua, had it been Moses, that he would been have been glorified, that he would have been deified, that he would have been not just the greatest teacher but the greatest leader and be elevated to something beyond human. And the fact that he hit the rock and he was chastised and punished and not permitted this, we realize. Just like the patriarchs and the matriarchs, they're very, very human. And so that was always a take that I had from a practical point of view, why Moses was not really permitted to enter the land. It's a speculation. <coughs> a speculation can appeal to one or not. I think there's a subjective element in it. And personally, I'm not so convinced by it, but I, I hear you, you have an intelligent way of, of presenting it. So I, I hear what you're saying. I hope everybody comes back for the other two lectures because part of what happens in late antiquity and then in early Islam and then throughout the Western tradition is that Moses does become a kind of hero or a counter hero. So there is a heroization of Moses against which some of the rabbinic uh, ways of handling Moses, the, uh, what, what did Susan Handelman uh, call, call the, the famous book she wrote is, uh, the slayers of Moses, she calls the rabbis the slayers of Moses. But in many other traditions, Moses was not slain, but was actually um, turned into a hero. And it begins with Philo and Josephus in their respective lives of Moses. And, um, and there are later examples that we could cite. So, so um, by the way, the Samaritans, who also have the Torah and follow the Torah, have a much greater regard for Moses again, in late antiquity, than, than the rabbis do. So it's really interesting what happens in these different traditions and how they, how they deal with it. But I want to, to ask uh, um, uh, Mackenzie very briefly to ask you a question. And then we have Andrea, Professor Andrea Berlin, uh, have a question from her posted in the chat. So I will read that. So Mackenzie, you go. Thank you. Um, I had a, so I had a question. I think it was in either the book of Leviticus or Exodus when Moses comes down the mountain and he's glowing and he has to veil himself in order to um, hide the light that he's glowing from having been in the uh, presence of YHWH. Um, could, does this possibly go also into the narrative of desire and joy, um, like preceding the book of Deuteron Deuteronomy? That he's glowing, you're suggesting that he's glowing with after the contact with God? Yes. It could, um, except that I have a, a displaced reading of, of, his, of the glowing face, um, which seems to me, it's, it's, it's one that I, I, 
I'm convinced by. <laughs> Uh, and that is that the glow on his face comes again precisely from the blocking of his desire when God hides his eyes, when God blocks his eyes from seeing God's presence. And it's therefore that first experience of having to make something of the trace of, God, of God's having been there, that interpretive stance begins there. It begins there with Moses and it creates a certain, that, that is the glow. The glow is that sense of having made something of God's absence. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's my reading, but what you're saying is certainly a possible, possible reading and it, it's backed up by some things in the text. Yes. Thank you. Um, 